I've been making a bit of a technology journey, changing in technology, and if you've known me for, I know that you guys have only known me for not, not too long, but my parents have known me for a long time, and they're here today, and so I, usually when they're here, I tell you to be on your best behavior, so be on your best behavior. My parents are here. But uh, technology has always been something, a part of my life. It, it, I just, I remember from a very young age, I was playing around on a computer and throwing in the little floppy disks and running executable files, learning MS-DOS. I learned HTML when it came out, all of the websites and website buildings. It's something that I've done since I was, since I was really young. And I have just thoroughly enjoyed the technology as it's come through the ages, as the iPhone came out and, and that was a, I mean, that was a big deal. And, and having, having one of those first iPhones was, I, man, I felt like I was, I arrived. And I, oh, and then, you know, when the, when the iPad came out, my goodness. And then, you know, and then the, the, all the Apple Watch came out. And it's kind of, if you can kind of th- see the theme, I'm kind of an Apple fan. But in that, I would also say that my life has gotten a lot more hectic and complicated and uh, really kind of anxious. And so I'm transitioning. I'm, I'm kind of going backwards in the technological world. While there are some things that I've got to, I still have to do my job, and there are certain applications that I've got to do those things, there are some things that I am, I am changing, and whether it's a different watch or whether it's a different phone or things like that. But one of the things about that Apple Watch is, and I don't know if you know too much about the the smart watches and the but especially the Apple Watch. It's kind of a it, it's it's one of those things that it tracks your activity throughout the day and it sends you notifications and so when you get a text message you're constantly doing this. So if ever I was talking to you and I'd always do this, I'm not like okay when are you going to be done talking. It was more along the lines of oh someone's calling me or someone's texting me and it just really was kind of getting on my nerves. But one of the other things I but I did really enjoy was the exercise tracking side of things. You know, you could set it to where you're, you're, you're on a walk or you're on a, uh, uh, I was going to say run, but let's be real. So you're on a walk uh, or, you, you know, like one of those jog walks or a bicycle ride or hiking or whatever. You set it on there and it tracks you and it, it tracks your heart. It tracks how far you've gone and, and all those different things. And there are times that, man, I would, I'd be working out. Be on the bicycle uh, and I, you know, spin bike, and I'm going along, and you know, I've set it, and, and all those things. I think I'm doing a really, really good job. I'm just trekking forward, and then I get this little thing on my watch. I think someone's, you know, texting me or someone's calling me. Oh no, the watch says, "Are you still working out? You seem like you're done." And you can tell it, no, I'm still working, or yeah, I'm done, or whatever. Because what they're doing is like, you know, if you forget to turn off the workout, and you've gone along with your normal day, but I have not stopped working out. How dare you say that I, it looks as though I have finished, because I have certainly not finished. Do you not feel the sweat? Do you not feel the heart? What is going on, Apple? Why in the world would you do this? It really kind of catches me off guard, and I begin to think about it. How many of us? Going through life, things are trekking along. We think our spiritual life is just great. We're, 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 we're learning more about, we're, about Christ. We're, we, we think we've, we've got the, the Bible study thing down. We've got the prayer thing down. We're just kind of moving. And can you imagine if there was like some type of spiritual pedometer out there that just kind of tapped you and was like, are you, are you, done? Are, are you still going? Because it doesn't look like you're going. Are you still going? <laughs> Man, I thought about that, and I thought, man, I wonder how many times God has tried to maybe slap me upside the head going, here you think you've been making progress, and you haven't. Oof. Oof. That's kind of a tough wake-up call, isn't it? Have you ever been caught off guard before? Thinking that things are going a certain way. This is the direction. This is the way I want my life to go. This is the way that, this is where I, I want my, the, the, the direction where, where my family and the, the career path and all these different things. Things are going just the way that I planned only to get some type of news, change of plans where you go, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't where I thought I'd be. This isn't where I thought I was going. This isn't, and we get caught off guard. But what if we get caught off guard in a different sense? 
I'll explain as, as we go along. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts. As we take a look at this story, in the New Testament church, by the way, it's kind of a side note, um, last week I was able to, we were able to re-record uh, the second angel's message down in Bridger, and, uh, and, and so I, I just, this week was extremely, extremely busy um, with conference stuff and all that kind of stuff with constituency going on. So as soon as I get it edited and uploaded, it'll be up there. So we'll have angel number two and then three and then the conclusion. So I apologize for the delay on our YouTube, but it'll, it'll get there, I promise, okay? Now, in, in Acts chapter 12, this is, you got to look at, at what has happened so far in the early church. You got to think that, that Jesus has ascended. The disciples have experienced Pentecost. They've experienced the Holy Spirit that has descended upon them. Things are moving. Things are shaking. Things are growing, including tension. Tension is growing because as, as Peter has been going and sharing the gospel message, remember it's Peter who experiences the Holy Spirit in, in just this mighty way. It's Peter who's experienced the, the dream about going and, and sharing the message, the gospel message with the Gentiles. It's, Peter has played a huge role in this church and it's Peter that, it, that we see land in this story of of what is happening because as he's sharing these things the tension is building between well between the jewish nation and this new christian christ way following group of people and now you've got the gentiles who are entering the equation and they're trying to follow jesus but man there's just some Everyone's kind of arguing about what, you know, what's acceptable, how do Gentiles become one of us, and all those different things that come with it. And so tensions are building, but also Roman rule is, is, is growing and building as well. And so there's a lot of things that are culminating, but yet at the same time, you can imagine that the church is really excited about what is happening. Wouldn't you be? If you're part of the Acts church, the early church, wouldn't you be ecstatic about going to different places and seeing thousands of people added to the church every day? I mean, isn't that just amazing? To be able to experience the miracles that they were experiencing, to be able to experience conversions after conversion after conversion, it would be a really exciting time to be alive and to be a part of that church. But it would also be a pretty scary time And as we see here in this story in the book of Acts chapter 12, it it opens up with Herod. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's let's pray and ask the Spirit to guide us in this. Father in heaven, as we open up your word now, speak to us. Speak to us. Transform our hearts. Show us what we need to see today. Anoint my lips and my mind that the words that I speak would be from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 12, verse 1, it says, About that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Herod, Herod the king, this is not Herod the Great, this is Herod Agrippa the First. And this guy is a little bit, he's got a unique history. And well, we, if we have time, we, we may break that down a little bit as to, to who he was and why he did what he did. But in, in verse 2, it says, He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. Now, can you imagine just for a moment that that here they are trucking away, doing some really amazing things for God, the, the church, and then James. James, the brother of John, is killed. And you know, it's interesting, it's, it's just almost like this, this quick 
little thing that, that, that Luke is writing. He says it's about the time of Herod. He started being violent to the church. He killed James, and now let's talk about Peter. But you would imagine that that whole thing with James was pretty rattling. Wouldn't that be? I mean, James would be, I mean, he's, the, he's one of the apostles. He would have been the first apostle to be killed. And you can, I, I know I would, I would be sitting there going, you know, just, do, are, guys, are we, <laughs> I mean, as human as disciples were, you'd think that, yeah, I'd probably be right there with them going, you know, maybe we need to lay low a little bit. Maybe this is just not, maybe we're drawing a little bit too much attention to us. Maybe, you know, this, Herod is out of control. See, again, Herod, interesting, Herod comes from, uh, he, he even has some Jewish roots. His grandmother was, 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 a, was a princess type individual that came from the Jews. And, and so he's actually pro-Jew and he's pro-Pharisee. And the records indicate that this Herod was actually a temple goer regularly. So here's a guy who is still very much a temple goer. Here's a guy who's very much uh, it plugged into the whole uh, Pharisee mindset and very kind of against the whole new movement of Jesus type thing. And so in that, there's also some political motives here because he's still in charge of the area. And so he kills James and he gets applause. Oh, I get, you know, Jews already like me because I'm already, you know, kind of part Jewish, but now I get to, if I mess with this whole Christianity thing or this Jesus movement thing, I get even more praise. So in that, he, he grabs Peter. Now, in, 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 and I would wonder if the, the whole James thing came suddenly, if it was quick. We don't have any details on it. Like, did they pray for James and it didn't, he didn't get rescued, or did they, it just came, and they thought, well, you know, it, maybe James will get out, and he didn't, and now they're realizing, wait, we, we need to do something about this. And so, in that context, we see they seize Peter at the same time that they would have seized Jesus. About that same, I mean, think about it, Passover time, time of unleavened bread, this is a historical moment for them. And now he's brought Peter, they've put him in prison, and he's sitting there waiting. And in this time, as he's in prison, they're just simply waiting for him to get out so they can have trial, and ultimately, they're going to kill him. And that's going to be a huge blow to the church. That's going to be a big, big, I don't know if you want to call it a hindrance or whatever you want to call it, but it would be, it would be shaking to them, I would imagine. And so what do they do? Well, it tells us in verse 5, the end of verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Can we just pause there for a moment? Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer. Earnest prayer. Why? Wow. What does this mean? What, 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 is this, what is this idea of, 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 of earnest prayer? Why did they write it in this way? And, and I want us to just pause in this because as we go forward with where we are in Billings and where we are as a church family and where things have been, I believe that we must follow these same principles. That if, if there's some shaking that's happened, if there is something where, where there is some, you know, this, in this case, it's Herod the king is laying violent hands, but it doesn't have to be just violent hands. It can be violent words. It could be, it could be uh, violent gossip. It could be violent accusation. It could be all types of things that has come. And you would imagine that, that, that I can see that as we look at in, in where we are as a church, we kind of look at it and go, whoa. Maybe it's a little jolting. Maybe it's a little, okay, what, what's going on? But let me tell you something. There's nothing that this early church could have done to free Peter. Peter had these, these four squads 
of guards around them, which means that there was probably four, four groups of guards four different times that would change out, and two of those guards were chained directly onto Peter, and two of them were guarding the gate where you could enter. There's nothing that the church could have done. They couldn't have gone there, and, and even if they, they had a whole bunch of them, they wouldn't have been able to break through. Even if they would have taken out the guards, they wouldn't be able to get through the iron gate. Even if they got through the iron gate, they wouldn't be able to get to the other two guards. They wouldn't be able to unlock Peter. There's nothing that the church could have done. There's, you know, it's not like they could come together for a board meeting and say, hey, you know, we got to have a, let, let's, let's vote. <laughs> we vote to let Peter go free. Okay. You know, there, there's just, there's nothing that the church at this time could have done with their own human abilities and I'm at a place where I would say that there's nothing that the Billings Church can do humanly with any human abilities to move forward period now for those of you that may, may not really know all the, the details that have, that have been going on that's okay just keep the, keep the faith alright for those of you that have been kind of, uh, kind of in, the, in the know of, of, of different things like that, I'm just telling you. And I told this to, the, to, our, to our board this last week. How do I say this? I'm tired of playing games. We need to get on our knees and pray hard. Pray, pray, pray. Because there's no board vote, there's no letter, there's no stance, there's no nothing that's going to move anything forward. Only by the power of God. Only. And so I am bringing us to, to this idea of we must be praying earnestly as a church to our God. Just as Peter was in prison and there's no, it is impossible for him, whatever impossible situations that are around us, we must pray earnestly as a church to our God. If we have a community of billings who are chained in darkness from what the enemy has done in their life and they don't know the good news of Jesus Christ, we must pray earnestly as a church to our God to set them free, to bring light to them to set people free in this own church, to bring light to it. This is an act that only God can do. And let me tell you something. God loves impossible situations. He loves... I, can you just imagine how much he just sat there and just grinned at Peter? Peter? Peter's sleeping. <laughs> we'll get there. Peter's asleep. Like, he's cool. He's conked out next to the guards, whatever. Like, he has so much trust in his heavenly Father, that if this is it for him, then it's it for him. If it's not, it's not. He knows God's in control. I love that. And whether it is, whether it is a, a group of people standing on this edge looking at the sea, going, how in the world are we going to get across? Or whether it's a guy who's been faithful to God that he's getting ready to be thrown into a pit of lions. Or whether it's another set of people who are faithful to God that get thrown into this fiery furnace. God loves impossible situations. He loves it. And here we have Peter in an impossible situation. And the answer? Prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Earnest prayer. What does that even mean, earnest? I remember this, the movies, Ernest Goes to Camp. Is that what we're, is that we're talking? Like this doesn't even, what is Earnest. This word that is coming is, is this word, it's the same word that is used in the description of when Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. Yes, oh snap is right. This word this idea of without stopping, continuously. That's, that's one of the first things that it means. I know that God is a powerful God. And I know that, you know, sometimes we get to the thing that all we got to do is just pray one time for something 
And God's just going to do what he does, and then we can walk away from it and never have to worry about it again. But we see in parables and in stories, Jesus does talk about being persistent in prayer and to bring it continuously. There's even times that Jesus had to pray more than once. Do you know that? Jesus! To, to cast out demons, he had to pray more than once. To, to heal someone's blindness, he had to pray more than once. There were times where Jesus had to do it more than once. He had to continuously do it. And I would say that you can't just say, Lord, be with our church. Well, of course, he's with our church. What is, it that we, what is it that we really are praying for God to do in our community of believers? And, and, and we look at this idea of, of not just one and done, but continuously. And I know, I know. You know, prayer meetings aren't popular much today because people don't like to just come and sit and pray for hours upon hours. It's weird. I don't know why, but it is. But maybe that's not what earnestly is really talking about. Maybe it's not just for hours upon hours. Maybe it's bringing it before God over and over and over again. God, I can just imagine. Father, Peter, Peter needs you. Peter, there's nothing we can do. Peter needs to be set free. Can you imagine? They go, God, be with Peter. Poor Peter! <laughs> but they are, they are they're, they're not, that, again, continuously, earnestly, continuously. Another way that you could look at the word uh, 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 earnestly, this idea of being eager. And this is where you kind of get into the time where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew time was of the essence. There he was the night before his crucifixion, and he is pleading with his father. He is pleading, not just let this cup pass from me, but there is this idea of us being one with Christ and being one with each other, just as Christ and the Father are one. I mean, there's some beautiful power, and he knew this is it. This is the time. There is an earnest prayer. Time is of the essence And I look at it in our world today, time is of the essence. We must be praying more fervently, more earnestly, with intensity, eagerly, because we know, we know that the devil is out to devour and to deceive and to kill. And if our prayers are there to help save people who are being devoured, then time is of the essence. And we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop praying. We're not going to stop praying for our church. We're not going to stop praying for our community. Continuously, earnestly, or eager, time is of the essence. Another way you look at this word and another way that it's translated is fervently or passionately. Now, you think about this for a moment. The church says, So Peter was kept in prison. But the church prayed to God continuously, eagerly, and passionately. That sounds a little bit, a little bit different than just earnest prayer. Continuously, eagerly, passionately. Why passionately? Because they loved Peter. They loved Peter. They knew that Peter was... was the rock of that group, that, that Jesus had, had given so much trust and emphasis to what was going on in, in Peter, and, and Peter has played a huge role in this kingdom gospel message being proclaimed to everyone, and not just that, they loved him as a person. They loved him as an individual. They cared for him. They had eaten with him. They had prayed with him. They had washed each other's feet together. They had seen some of the craziest things together. They wept together. They did everything together. They, they, they loved Peter. So that's why they prayed passionately because they had love for him. And I will tell you this, my church, that unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're not going to pray passionately for our community because we don't really love our community because we have to love our community through the power 
of Christ. And when we choose to love our community, we are going to pray passionate for them. We're going we're gonna to keep praying for them, and we're going to pray because time is of the essence. We're going to pray for our church family, each other, whether they're in this building or whether they're not. We are going to pray for our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ, because we love them. We have passion for them, compassion for them. We, we know time is of the essence. We're not going to stop. And because we care about them. So here's the church praying earnestly for Peter. And they're praying to God. And the church was praying together as one united group of people. There's power in that, church. There's power in prayer. I know that you know that. But we have to stop thinking it as, well, the only thing we can do is pray. No. The best thing and first thing we get to do is take this to our Father in Heaven. And what great privilege it is to take it to God together as one and that was the will and desire of Jesus as he prayed there in Gethsemane, and he was praying for it earnestly. The story continues. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and centuries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I, there's just a lot of humor in this story. Because uh, uh, this angel of light shines up. And you've got to think, this angel of light has shown up in, in the, the fields of shepherds where they couldn't even see. These, these angels have shown up in just crazy ways, right? And, and, and here is Peter sleeping through all of it. And the, the angel, I, I don't know if the angel like poked him or if it were me, I'd probably be like, get up, man. Don't you see that there's, we're here. The cavalry's here. We're getting ready to take you out. And so here, they, you know, they touch him on the side. Peter wakes up and let's get going because now they're, now they're going to move. The chains fell off his hands just like that. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. So whatever he, you know, he, he probably took off his, his outer garments or whatever, and there he is in prison. And, and I don't know if he even had that stuff. Did the angel just provide it? Did the angel go get it off the shelf and say, here you go? He like, I don't know. But here he says, put this on. We got to go. We got to get out of here. And so he did. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that, was, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Isn't this amazing? Have you ever had those moments in your life where you're like, man, I just feel like I'm dreaming right now. And here is Peter. Just, okay, I'll get ready. I'll get dressed. Maybe it's that groggy morning, I don't know, whatever it was. And there he is walking and following and he doesn't even realize that what's going on. He thinks he's having a dream. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. Listen to this. This iron gate, it opened for them on their own accord. Just like it had like at the mall, like the little motion sensor, like it just opened up. There it is. The iron gate opens and Peter walks through it. They went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. How cool is this? That, that this angel shows up in the cell, breaks him free, wakes him up, tells him to get dressed, leads him, they walk, gates open, they get out into the street, and then the angel goes, okay, I'm not needed anymore, goodbye. <laughs> and the light is gone, and the leading is gone, and it's all gone, and God has, has answered the prayer of the church. When Peter came to himself, and then, so this idea of going, wait, I'm not dreaming? Like, this is real? 
So he, he came to himself. He said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. He knew right then and there that he had been rescued, that this was a miracle from God. And so what does he do? He, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So the church has been praying, and there's a group of the church that are praying in Mary's house, the mom of John Mark. And as they are praying, he knocked at the door of the gateway. There's, like I said, there's humor and irony in this story. That Peter, that was able to lose chains, to walk out of a prison, and to walk out of an iron gate because it opens for themselves, he goes to the place of the church, and the door is locked, and he has to knock. God was able and willing to break open the door to freedom, but he still had to knock at the door of the church. Hang in there with me. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. <laughs> they had been praying for Peter. And now Peter is there. God has answered the prayer. And they, can you imagine? Who is it? <laughs> they hear it. Who's out there? Oh, it's, it's me. It's Peter. Let me in. <gasps> and she runs back inside. Guys, it's Peter. It's Peter. It's Peter. And she leaves him out there at the gate. And so she goes in. And they said to her, you're out of your mind, lady. You were out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, no, it's his angel. But can Peter continued knocking. <laughs> Here they are. Can we just picture it? They've been praying. Peter is set free. Peter is outside trying to get in, and they want to have an argument whether or not Peter's there or not. See, church folk love to argue. We've been arguing since there and before. And so here they were. They, you know, no, you're, you're crazy, Rhoda. Crazy Rhoda, at it again. You know, you just imagine all this stuff that they're, that they're saying about, about each other. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's his angel. It's something, it's something else, whatever. No, 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 no. And all you know what all they had to do? All they had to do was go outside. All they had to do was walk outside and see for themselves and the argument would have been done and would have been over. All they had to do was go seek it out for themselves. Instead of just sitting there, you know, bickering and arguing and complaining, whatever it was, all they had to do was just look outside and see for themselves and recognize right off the bat, wait, Peter is here. And so they go out there. And you know what? The Bible says that Peter had to continue knocking. And when they opened it, they saw him and were amazed. They were shocked. They were surprised. And, and Peter says, motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he describes to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. And we don't know what happened to Peter after that. Peter, like, goes underground. He's, he's, he's gone. We don't get any more reports of it. But we know that he was, he was set free. And he, you know, shh, keep it down. Because they're in a part of town where there's probably other people that are very much pro-Pharisee, pro-Jew, pro-everything and saying, you know, they, they would have alerted everything. And here he is out there knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and they don't believe their prayers have been answered. My church family, if we've been praying, if we've been praying as a church, I mean really been praying as a church, for God to bring the community of Billings and to set them free from the darkness and from the chains that are out there that the enemy has been holding, you better be ready to open those doors and allow God to bring people here. I don't, we cannot sit here and go, oh my goodness, look at all these people. At the same time, 
If there's not as many as we hoped or expected, we can't sit there and go, God, why didn't you bring more people? I look at it this way. God will give whom he trusts us with. I'm paraphrasing, and I don't know where the quote is, but it's in the book of evangelism somewhere, where Ellen White shares that God actually holds people back from churches until they're ready to receive them with love. Because if they came beforehand, they would end up in worse place than what they were. It's why we've been praying week after week throughout these hallways, throughout the bathrooms, throughout the the classrooms, in the sanctuary, in the offices. We have been praying and we've been praying and we've been praying and anointing and asking God's Spirit to reside here and nothing else. And we are praying fervently, earnestly, continuously that God would continue to work miracles. But I'm telling you, church, we can't get caught off guard when God chooses to answer our prayers. We can't get caught off guard. And so I want to ask you as a church, as we come together for this meeting, that we would pray earnestly as a church to God as we are praying a prayer of intercession much like the church was praying for Peter. That we are praying for one another and we are praying for our community. And this needs to be a prayer of earnestness. This needs to be a prayer of fervent prayer, seeking God with all of our hearts. And I want to ask you, my church family, to join, to be a part of this. And to be a part of this meeting and to come and to support and to love on people. And when you see a head that you don't recognize, you pray for that person and you pray that God's Spirit would be working on them and to to reveal His love and His gospel to them. That you'd be praying for God's holy angels to be moving and around and protecting and guiding and directing and shining His light bright. That we as a church would keep moving and, and keep praying and not stop and pray knowing that time is of the essence. Church family, I am begging you, I am pleading with you, if you really truly desire for God to do His will on earth as it is in heaven, you got to pray it down. We've got we to gotta pray it here. We've got to invite God, His Spirit, into this place. And in, and, and in doing that, we also need to pray that God would take anything that is not of Him away from this place and cast it far to the depths of hell. We're asking Christ to cleanse us and to cleanse this place with His blood. And we are moving forward in the name of Jesus. Only by prayer. Are you with us? Are we together in prayer, in prayer, and in prayer? We're not going to get caught off guard. We are going to stay focused. We're going to pray continuously. We're going to pray that time is of the essence. And we are going to pray with a whole lot of compassion because we choose to love each other and to love God and to love this community. Yes? Yes. Let's pray now. Father in heaven, just as you broke Peter free from the chains of that prison in the darkness of night, we pray that you would send your angels to set us free from the darkness and the chains that may be holding us back. the chains of habitual sin, the chains of pride, the chains of selfishness, the chains, the chains of lies and the chains of accusation, the chains, the chains, the chains. Lord, break them free in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would send your holy angels out into this city of, of billings and God to set your people free. And God, I pray, that, I pray that our hearts are ready and that this place is ready to receive your children 
anyone and everyone you trust us with. May we receive them with love, with compassion, with grace as we walk this journey together called life. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And we thank you for answering our prayer. God, that we would swing the doors wide open, ready, ready to see who you will send. Lord, whether it's one, or whether it's a hundred, or whether it's 500, God, we trust you, and we know, we know that you're working. Please, God, prepare our hearts to be able to prepare, to, to pray for these people. Help us, Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may pray earnestly. We thank you for hearing us today, God. I thank you for my church family. Bless them abundantly. Bless their families. Bless their homes. Consecrate them. Make them holy. Prepare us to see you parting the sea. Because if you've done it before, we believe you will do it again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.